Dr. Laura Archuleta. And I'm so excited to have her here for a second time. So thank you, Dr. Laura. We're very happy to have you here. She attended medical school at Creighton University, Omaha, Nebraska, and completed her family medicine residency through the University of Iowa Sioux City training site. She practiced in Jamestown for three years before settling in Bismarck, Mandan area. She practices family medicine through the CHI St. Alexis Mandan Clinic, and she sees patients for inpatient palliative care medicine program. She's the medical director for CHI St. Alexis Palliative Care and for the CHI Health at Home Hospice Program. She holds a certificate and, uh, for added qualifications for hospice and palliative medicine. So at this time, I will turn it over to her. Dr. Laura, please begin. All right, thank you. Um, while you were introducing me, I thought I was unmuting and I hung up, so I'm back and I think we're set. <laughs> we're glad to have you I think it's going to be one of those days. <laughs> my goal was to learn how to use my own slides and, and do this from my screen, but of course I didn't, so I'm going to need to have you advance me again this time. No problem. So let's Okay, we'll go to the first slide. And I'm seeing a lot of names here that are people that are probably better trained and more experienced than I am. So I gotta admit, this is slightly intimidating, but hey, we'll, we'll just go with it. Um, so as we're, today is kind of a hodgepodge of miscellaneous symptoms. Um, there's five or six through the slides here that we'll go through. Um, I, it's kind of what's in my toolbox for um, end of life care. And again, we all know that the definition of palliative medicine is far beyond what just takes place at end of life. But I think some of the most difficult symptom management probably comes as we're getting further along in disease progression and we're looking more at those, those um, terminal stages where there's less curative and more palliative medicine going on. So this is, uh, a lot of these t uh, techniques can be used for non hospice patients as well, but kind of so there is definitely some crossover. Um, well, I'll just dive right in and start with nausea. Um, obviously, we start with the non pharmacologic things first. And I think with any of our symptom management, uh, the, what drew me to palliative medicine and what still is my favorite part of it is that it is common sense. Um, we don't worry about a lot of rocket science here. We do what kind of becomes intuitive for us. So let's start by asking the patient, do you want to eat? Um, you know, if they just got back from a treatment and they're absolutely exhausted, now is probably not the best time to be pushing food on them. So let's make it easier. Let's give them a little bit of time to rest. And okay, when would you like us to, to get you something? Um, allow as much choice as possible. One of the first things that I do in the hospital is uh, check, um, check the dietary um, restrictions obviously, and if they're on just a general diet, I will tell them, please feel free to bring in food from home. Um, institution food is not good on a good day. Um, so if grandma makes a chicken noodle soup that you're particularly fond of, please bring that in, whatever we can do to keep that, that intake up and, and do the things that are appealing to you. Um, the, the quantity of food, especially depending on the underlying cause of the nausea, the quantity of food makes a difference. So if you start to feel full, don't push. I know everyone's telling you, you've got to get as many calories in as possible, but you're going to do better if you do smaller, more frequent meals rather than trying to finish everything on your plate just to make, to make everyone else happy. Um, cold foods tend to be a little bit more palatable than hot foods. Um, bland foods tend to be better than spicy. But again, a lot of this is patient preference. I'll, I'll ask them, you know, what are the foods that go better for you? Because one person may say dairy is the only thing that soothes my stomach and another one will say I can eat anything but dairy. So always start by asking the patient what's been successful for you in the past. Um, and then avoiding strong odors. Um, you probably don't want a lot of onions and, and like the stuff that you can probably smell in my office right now probably wouldn't be great if you're dealing with a lot of chronic nausea. Um, next. Okay. Um, the, the pharmacotherapy for nausea is easier if we break down uh, where the nausea is coming from. I see this. I, I love our hospitalists. I think they do a phenomenal job, but I think, oh, back up one. Um, I think we kind of get in this mindset that nausea should respond to either Phenergan or Zofran or, you know, maybe some Compazine, but there's usually two or three that they'll throw at them and it, it, they may have varying levels of success. So it kind of helps to step back and look at where the, where the nausea is coming from. Um, cerebral causes would be obviously something going on in the brain. Um, told you it's one of those days. Um, brain metastasis from a cancer, meningeal irritation from infection 
infection or from radiation um, or anticipatory nausea. They've become so conditioned that every time they eat, they feel sick, that just the thought of, of eating makes them sick. Um, for the anticipatory nausea, I like the very low dose um, benzos, like maybe 0.25 of lorazepam. I don't want something that's going to make them so tired they can't eat, but to dose that maybe half an hour before they're supposed to eat, um, sometimes will take away that anticipatory nausea. Um, the dexamethasone works very well for metastatic nausea and meningeal irritation because, again, it's got that anti-inflammatory component. But especially in the, the hospice, and the, or I'm sorry, the outpatient or the um, um, acute treatment settings, we want to make sure we're coordinating with our oncologists. Some of the newer immunotherapy-based treatments don't work as well when patients are on dexamethasone, so we have to be considerate of what their goals of treatment are. Um, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, it just makes you sound really smart when you ask, talk about nausea coming from the CTZ. Um, that usually has to do with metabolites so, or side effects of medications. Um, if possible, obviously, if we can stop the offending medication, we'd sure like to do that, but otherwise, um, haloperidol and uh, Compazine and Phenergan all do work at that CTZ, and so do some of the newer nausea meds. Gosh, I'm dating myself. I still consider Zofran somewhat newer. Um, so, but those that are designed for chemotherapy-induced nausea work at that chemoreceptor trigger zone as well. Next. Um, GI tract, mechanical obstruction, um, decreased GI motility, delayed gastric emptying, um, irritation of the gastric mucosa. These are generally like the hyperacidity type treatments. So um, proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers. Um, if, it's, if it's a lot of, patient has a lot of belching and gas, um, something like cymethicone will um, help kind of dis dissipate that and might help them eat a little bit better. Um, the Reglan works well for the decreased GI motility, but only in the upper GI tract. So it's not going to work for someone with constipation, but um, for delayed gastric emptying and the upper GI stuff, the Reglan can sometimes move that through a little bit further. Um, erythromycin is another common one that's used for um, slow GI motility, but due to number of side effects, I plus both the Reglan and the um, erythromycin, they do help, but generally, a lot of times it's not enough to offset the side effects, especially with the erythromycin. So. We'll try some of these things, and then, of course, after 24 to 48 hours, you got to go back and reassess. Um, recent case that I had in the hospital, a palliative patient with severe nausea, she ended up on, I think it was six different agents for her nausea. Um, she also had a mixed uh, presentation as far as what was causing it. She'd been on chemo. Um, she also had severe ulcer disease, um, and then she had, um, what's the other one? I think there was some anticipatory nausea. Anyway, it was kind of a mess, and she ended up on, on six different medications when we were trying to get things under control. So we hit her basically with everything we could think of that might help one at a time. Okay, this didn't work. Let's add this. And then once symptoms were under control, then she could start to pick apart a little bit more. Okay, this med seems to be helping. This med doesn't. So again, we have to be reevaluating, get rid of what's not working so that we're not creating too much of a poly pharmacy uh, situation. Um, and then movement associated nausea coming from the vestibular system, um, the antihistamines, the anticholinergics like the scopolamine and meclizine are probably best for those. And next, constipation. Um, prevention is absolutely, I mean, if, if, my, I talk with our hospice nurses, if we get to a point where a patient needs um, an enema, we have failed them. We do, we're not aggressive enough with our constipation regimen. Um, always check the med list. If there's any opioid on there, there should be some type of, of um, bowel regimen involved. And just doing a detergent or stool softener is not going to be enough. Opiates slow GI motility, so you need something that's going to counteract that. Um, the other thing with opiates is that you can develop tolerance to almost all side effects of opiates, but you do not develop tolerance to the constipation. So I don't care if they've been on opiates for 20 years, they're still going to have to be attentive to the bowel regimen. Um, in our, our less burdened patients who are able to be a little more active and, and higher levels of functioning, um, the best ones for prevention are fluids, fiber, and increased activity. So, you know, if you can get them up out of bed and walking, fiber, I, in my primary care patients, that we're shooting for about 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day, and then at least that 8 to 10 glasses of water, um, just you know, with a general wellness type teaching for, for constipation, that's 
probably where you'd want to start. But again, that depends on our level of function. If we've got a stage four cancer patient who is only up limited parts of the day, her palliative performance status is only 60%, I'm probably not going to be pushing a whole lot of fiber with her. Um, lubricants, this is not real tactful, but this is what one of my pediatrician friends told me that they don't do anything to move things through faster, but they do grease the chute. Um, and actually that's pretty, that's pretty accurate. Um, the, the mineral oil used to be the old favorite. Now it's not very tasteful. You know, a lot of people just don't like the idea of that. Coconut oil is kind of a big fad for everything. And I've had real interesting success with a couple of our uh, geriatric hospice patients. They, you know, they'll live off of this insure boost supplements and if you put a couple tablespoons or even just one tablespoon of boost or of, of coconut oil you got to get it room temperature and kind of get it thinned out first but if you get that mixed up in your nutritional supplement that can really help with the um, constipation um, vaseline balls are on our hospice standing orders and i thought it was absolutely bizarre but they are awesome they work so well um, you take a container of plain Vaseline. I did have someone tell me not to use the um, baby powder flavored, and I didn't even want to know how they figured that out. Um, but you take a, tea, a container of Vaseline, you put it in the freezer, get it good and cold, and then you want to make like pea-sized balls. And then you can roll it in whatever the patient finds palatable. Um, some people use powdered sugar or that PB2, the powdered peanut butter stuff, or cocoa powder. Um, and then the patient just swallows two to three of those a day and increase or decrease as needed. And again, it has it has a lubricant effect. It helps soften the stools, and it does it does definitely do a good job with the constipation. Um, the stool softeners, as we said, will break up a hard stool, but that's about it. Um, getting into the stimulants and the osmotics, those are the ones that are going to be moving things through a little bit more quickly. Um, Dulcolax, either as oral or as suppository. Um, sometimes more. Um, I didn't even put that on there. Senna would be under the stimulants as well. Um, Senna and Dulcolax both can be, um, depends on the situation. Senna's kind of been the classic go-to for hospice. Sometimes causes more, um, more cramping than the osmotic laxatives like the Miralax. Um, but with the osmotic laxatives, you've got to be able to drink the eight ounces that the stuff dissolves in. So uh, kind of pick and choose and go back and forth. With Senna, um, huge dose range on it. You can go anywhere from one to two tabs a day up to max is supposed to be about eight tabs. Um, the one thing I do like about the the polyethylene glycol is that it's so easy to titrate. Um, you know, it's, it's a powder, so you use a little less, you use a little more. I tell patients, I, ideally, I'd like to have their stools at about pudding consistency. Again, it's a gross analogy I learned from my pediatrician friend, but we don't, when you've got such a limited amount of, of physical energy, you don't want to be having to spend all your energy trying to eliminate stool. So the softer we can keep it for patients, the better it's going to be. Obviously, not going to the extremes of diarrhea, but there too. Miralax is very easy to, to titrate. Um, the saline laxatives, we don't use a whole lot of. Um, with the magnesium component, if there's renal failure, we of course have to worry about electrolyte imbalances. Plus, they do tend to cause a lot more um, uh, cramping. But if we're really getting into a bind, they can be, they can be um, useful for the more severe levels. Next. Okay, so dyspnea. And again, remember, dyspnea is not a number on a screen or on a, on a SAT monitor. Dyspnea is how the patient looks. Um, in my notes, I'll comment, you know, patient appears to kipnic but not dyspnic or dyspnic but not to kipnic. So it's, it's the subjective sense of how the patient is feeling about their breathing. Um, the go-to for most people is, well, if they're short of breath, let's put them on oxygen. Um, and we all know that that doesn't always help. Um, they can have SATs of 99% and be incredibly dyspneic, or some of our COPDers can have SATs of literally 75% and they're feeling like it's just any old day. Um, the other issues with oxygen in the palliative setting is you know, the, the psychological effect for one thing. I know most of us as healthcare providers, I can walk in and out of a room and not even remember if they had oxygen on because I just don't see the cannula anymore. But you know, seeing experience with my own family members, oh yeah, she was back on the oxygen again today. There's that, you're sicker if you need the oxygen. So there's, there's that psychological side to it. Um, plus, you've got to think about the noise of the concentrator, tripping over the, um, the tubing and all of that. So there are oxygen is definitely effective, but there's definitely a downside to it as well. Um, getting into the pharmacotherapy, um, benzos, 
it can be helpful, especially in anxiety patients. And with COPD, there's such a tight association between the dyspnea and the anxiety. Um, I don't know, honestly, my personal opinion is I would take pain any day over shortness of breath. I just don't think there's anything more distressing than that feeling of not being able to get enough oxygen. Um, so the benzos can help with that. But again, we have to keep our doses low because we don't want to cause the respiratory suppression. Um, morphine, the way I explain it to my patients is that morphine acts in the brain stem on the site that triggers air hunger. So at doses that are lower than what we use for pain, um, we're going to find that the patient doesn't feel the air hunger as much. Um, they may still be just as dyspneic, and they're, or I'm sorry, they may be just as tachypneic, and their respirations may appear labored to us, but the patient's sensation of air hunger is going to be diminished. Um, morphine Extended release has kind of been the gold standard for treating dyspnea, but it does work with, with other opiates as well. In fact, I had one lady who was on hydrocodone. Um, she had been prescribed it postoperatively, a COPD patient, and um, found that she could just get a lot more done on those days that she took her hydrocodone. And as we were talking it through, she said she just felt so much less shortness of breath, and it was, it was half of a five milligram hydrocodone. Um, Corticosteroids, depending again on the underlying situation, the, the um, underlying diagnosis and what your goals of care are. Um, sometimes with our COPDers, we'll put them on a little bit of prednisone, um, but if, if we can manage it with other ways, especially, well, especially if it's a flare up. Um, I can think of a, a COPD slash lung cancer patient that we had not too long ago, and she started going into another exacerbation. So we increased, for her, it was dexamethasone. We bumped it up for a little while, but then, um, you know, it does boost the energy level. For her, she started getting more agitation. So we had to kind of bring it back down as she got through that, stero through that exacerbation. Um, Anticholinergics, usually that's more for the, the secretions related to um, if, if you've got like a real wet COPD or that's getting short of breath because they can't clear their secretions, you can go one of two ways. Um, the, the standard is always, well, do we try to dry it up and get rid of it? But sometimes that actually will cement the secretions more. So the other way to go at it would be to try to loosen it up with um, the guafenicin or the acetylcysteine nebulizers, which are really gross tasting, but they work. Um, and again, I, I try to get my patients on board with this that, okay, we're going to be trying to loosen the secretion so that you can try to get rid of them. You'll notice them. They'll still be there, but hopefully they're going to be easier to clear. Or if we're going to use the atropine, I'll tell them, okay, we're going to try we're going to try and dry this out. If it doesn't work and it makes it worse, okay, then we stop and we'll take the other approach. Um, so I've seen both ways work. It just kind of depends on the situation. Um, diuretics, if it's a cardiac patient, obviously, then, you know, we'll look more at using Lasix PRN depending on renal function and where they're at symptom-wise. And then, of course, the bronchodilators like the albuterol. Um, we tend to use more, um, depends on the patient, but we tend to use more short-acting bronchodilators. We don't get into a lot of the fancy, um, you know, some of the newer inhalers have the um, steroid, the anticholinergic, and the beta agonist all in one. Um, for one thing, on, on a hospice and palliative budget, we usually can't get into a lot of that. But when you're looking at symptom relief, a fast-acting bronchodilator is still going to be subjectively as good for a patient as, as some of the others, um, because that's what gives them the fast relief. Next. Okay, restlessness and delirium. Um, whenever possible, again, let's go back to our common sense and let's look for the underlying cause. Um, are they constipated? When was the last time they had a bowel movement? Um, does it palpate their abdomen? Does the bladder feel distended? Are they putting out any urine? Um, is there perhaps uh, an underlying infection? Um, Interesting side note, I went to a psych and neurology and primary care conference a few months ago, and the staff there was saying that the old um, wives' tale that that um, UTIs cause delirium is really falling by the wayside, and we really don't believe that that happens anymore. And I just kind of went, really? Because we see it all the time. So there's there, apparently there's some new conflict in the literature over whether UTIs and subclinical infections can cause delirium, but I don't know. I, I think it's, it's a pretty common finding. Um, if you can treat the underlying cause, do so. Um, with many of our hospice patients or those who are more seriously ill and aren't able to tell us what's wrong, we treat for pain first. So if you've got a patient who's restless and delirious, let's give them what's their short-acting pain med, let's give them a dose, and if they don't settle down after that, then we get into some of the pharmacotherapy. Um, our go-to, especially on the inpatient side, has always been the benzos, but really use with caution. Um, 
the reason is it, the benzodiazepine works at the GABA receptor in the body, and GABA is what is affected by alcohol. So if you think of this patient who already has an altered level of sensorium, they're already in and out and don't really know what's real and what's not, and now we're going to give them a couple of beers and see how they're feeling. They're going to be even less collect connected with reality. They're going to be even more, more confused, and I think that's where we see this paradoxical agitation sometimes because we've now made our delirious patient drunk. Um, it is still a very common thing to be done, especially in the skilled nursing facilities, the inpatient facilities, because they do make the patient appear more, more sedated. But that's exactly why, because we've sedated the patient. We've basically just knocked them out. Um, if you look at the antipsychotics, like the haloperidol, of course, is the gold standard for end-of-life care, but the newer agents, olanzapine, risperidone, um, uh, quetiapine, um, any of those are going to be more likely to try to correct what's going on in the brain that's causing the delirium and hopefully provide less sedation. So patients can hopefully think a little bit more clearly um, and resolve it rather by looking at the underlying cause rather than just knocking them out to get them through it. Um, the Olanzapine is kind of the up and comer for palliative medicine. Our psychiatrists are not real fond of it because it causes weight gain and it makes everybody tired. But in palliative medicine, sometimes that ends up being a big uh, benefit for us. It also is very similar to haloperidol in terms of its efficacy for vomiting, or I'm sorry, for nausea. Um, so we'll, if, if the haloperidol is working but not lasting long enough and they're also having sleep problems, they're also getting more delirious, okay, fine, let's just schedule some olanzapine at bedtime and you can kind of kill two birds or three or four birds even with one stone. Next. Okay, miscellaneous. This is just kind of what's in my favorite in my bag of tricks. Um, I kind of hesitated to share this because some of these are just really cool ideas and I feel really smart when people call and ask me for these kinds of things, but I'm going to share them all with you so that we can just make the world of palliative and hospice and end-of-life medicine look incredibly brilliant and, and resourceful. Um, for wound odor, please don't just use extra air fresheners. I can think of a patient we had up um, a couple months ago that had just this horrible necrotizing wound and there were like four air fresheners in the room. So all you could smell was perfume and wound and it was just, it was nauseating. I felt so bad for this guy. Um, we want something that's gonna absorb the wound um, or absorb the odor. So the coffee grounds under the bed and you can just go down to dietary, get their big old packs of coffee grounds, put them in um, any kind of a, like an emesis basin even. And you can hide it under the bed or, um, you know, someplace in a corner so it's not real visible. Shake it every couple hours, kind of freshen it up just like you would do with the kitty litter. Um, but that's something that most hospitals do have available. And you might have to take several bags of coffee grounds to get the job done. My favorite is the metronidazole on, on a wound that smells. Um, we almost always get pushback from pharmacy when we ask to do this, but they're actually getting much better now that they're getting a little more used to it. But you take four 500 milligram tablets of metronidazole and a liter of saline, and you just shake it all up in a spray bottle um, like you can get at the dollar store, and you spray it on the wound. Um, anaerobes kill odor, so <clears throat> I'm sorry, Metronidazole kills anaerobes, anaerobes cause odor. So you're not really doing anything to treat an infection in the wound, but it does make a big difference in um, getting rid of some of that odor. Um, we'll also sometimes sp um, soak the uh, bandage in the metronidazole solution before we put it on to kind of help um, a little bit longer. Um, bleeding wounds, um, we've had several, the fungating cancers in the head and neck that are real close to those um, great vessels. Um, if it's a smaller wound, um, the surgical band-aids like the Surgiseal and Silver Nitrate for little bleeders, it's nice to kind of keep those out in the home and you can kind of put out little oozers with that. Um, but oftentimes it's a matter of education. Um, we've had several instances where we'll, we'll just let the family know, okay, if something happens, I want you to be prepared. Um, you may see a lot of blood, so let's get some dark colored towels. Let's make sure that the patient is on is not laying on something white so that if something does happen, it's a little less startling for that. And in those cases where we've got a big neck cancer or something that's, that's high risk for bleeding, we'll try to talk through the family, what are we going to do if this wound bleeds? Um, you know, do you want to come in and, and try to rehab or, I mean, try to stabilize that way? Um, and, you know, nine times out of 10, if they're at that point of hospice, they'll say no, they want to manage it at home. So that's when the nurse gets a 
911 page that they need to get out and help as soon as they can. Um, and in the meantime, you know, the patient has been instructed there's an emergency kit in the home with anxiolytics to help keep everybody calm, although only the patient can use them, the caregivers cannot. Um, so you basically you medicate for anxiety, you hold pressure, you use those dark towels, and hopefully we see what happens. Um, bladder bowel spasms, the antispasmodics or anti-smooth muscle spasms, the hyoscyamine, dicyclamine. Um, hyoscyamine we use quite a bit on our standing orders. We use it to dry secretions. We use it for bladder spasm. We use it for um, uh, like irritable bowel type pain. Um, oxybutynin we always think of for bladder spasm also works for, bo for bowel spasm. We very rarely need to use BNO suppositories. Usually the other things kind of work uh, just as well if not better, um, but the BNO has always been kind of the old, the old standard. Um, with cough, again, the dextromethorphan works at the opiate receptor or just go to the opiate. Um, codeine, I know, is what's used in, in um, primary care circles. It's usually the, the Robitussin with codeine. In, in palliative circles, we really don't like codeine because codeine's metabolites tend to cause more nausea and vomiting, and there's, you get more, more toxicity off the codeine than you would with just using a straight morphine. Um, and we had one case several years ago, it was, I think it was a uh, lung tumor, and this poor lady had just this horrible cough, so we had our pharmacist do a literature search, and sure enough, they found that SSRIs could be used for, um, for chronic cough. She used paroxetine, I think it was only 10 or 20 milligrams, we didn't go real high with the dose, and it took about two weeks, but the patient did feel she got relief with that. Um, nebulized lidocaine, the literature doesn't really have much favor for this because on a, on, a, on a larger scale, it doesn't do much. But subselecting out the right type of patient, if you've got somebody that's got like a, a throat cancer or some kind of nasopharyngeal irritation, um, the nebulized lidocaine is just gonna, gonna numb that enough that they won't feel that so much. And then for terminal secretions, again, the anticholinergic. Anti I think that's the last slide, maybe? Yes, it is. Okay, so now is, question and answer or case? Yeah, a couple things. We just kind of blacked out for a second Sorry, here. Ooh. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so we just blacked out for a little bit. Did everybody see the last of the slides and everything? We just want to confirm with everybody. You can, you know, do anything. But if you did not get that, make sure that you let us know. But we kind of had a quick blackout over here. We want to make sure. Um, I would just like to comment. Uh, that, that was awesome, by the way, Dr. Laura. And I have just a couple of other quick things. Um, I don't know if anybody, because of more of a palliative than just the hospice um, one, for um, the bowel thing, we, we talk about, you know, because not everybody wants to be at mush if they're all walking around, et cetera. So we use the Bristol bowel scale a lot, and we talk about slippery snake as being what we want versus the rabbit turns versus water, you know, and kind of go that way for that, just a quick one. Um, we also found for wound odor, one of the other things that, is, you know, again, anecdotal type things like you were talking about, a dryer sheet. If you have many layers of um, dressing there, doing there at the very top one before you, we do that, just have a dryer sheet as worked um, from what we've heard anecdotally. And then um, would you address magic mouthwash? Oh, yeah. Um, first of all, those are great tips. I always forget about the Bristol scale. I use it with some of my kids in, in primary care, but yeah, that's a really good idea. We need to integrate that more. Um, and I think I might go buy some dryer sheets for the team too. Um, <laughs> um, free, free and clear, do the very light scented. You don't want to do Yeah, yeah, products. not the real heavy perfumed one. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. Um, magic mouthwash depends on what you're trying to treat. Um, my, I like, um, when I can, I try to put a little bit of steroid in it, especially with like the, um, the chemotherapy induced mucositis. Um, the, the antifungal usually doesn't do anything. So I'll do the viscous lidocaine with the Maalox just kind of helps, helps it stick a little bit better. Um, the Benadryl helps with the... Methadone or, or whatever steroid you can find that your pharmacist can throw in there. Sometimes they'll use um, Kenalog or just there's like 400 recipes for this stuff. Um, the, with mouth sores, we'll also use um, 
Kenalog in Aura Base. It's just a, like a Kenalog ointment that you can put on a Q-tip and then the patient can just kind of dab it on as needed. Or you can do that with viscous lidocaine also. Put a, kid, put a little 30 ml cup of viscous lidocaine at the bedside with a Q-tip and then they can apply it as needed to wherever the sores are. The thing too is so, um, also to keep in mind from the palliative all the way to hospice perspective is cost. And, uh, you know, if people do have, you know, compounding, that was another concern, you know, where people have had that in the past and things too. But, you know, some of these things, it's nice to say, work with, even with the pharmacist and stuff, what's our most frugal thing for anybody. It doesn't matter if they're on hospice or, you know, involved in hospice or anywhere along the line for uh, palliative perspective as well too. So just want to throw that in there too. So. Um, again, just wanted to open up for questions or other ideas or things that have worked for people in the past. This is a great time for dialogue uh, before we get to our case. So again, you can come off mute. Feel free to do so. Um, just introduce yourself, where you're from, and either your question or suggestion. Otherwise, feel free to go into chat. Give just a couple more seconds if you think of anything. We need time to process in our brain. <laughs> but I, I love that we can do anecdotal, you know, in, in settings like this, that not everything has to be purely evidence-based and researched all the way that by trial and error, exactly like you said, you know, what's worked, et cetera. Okay, maybe you'll think of things as we go along. Go ahead, doctor. Okay, so we're going to do the case study? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see. Do you have the slides for the case? Yeah. Do there you want we me go. to introduce it or do you want to go ahead since you... Yeah, uh, please there. go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so I did, a, a, instead of just one, because most of the people we take care of have multiple symptoms, we, you know, will often use like the ESS symptom, symptom, you know, scale. There are many other ones that we use out there. But it's such an important thing to be really looking at it. So I pulled together multi-symptoms. So uh, we'll watch our time here so we don't go too long because you've given some really good ideas so we can really hone in specifically on this case. So next slide, please. So this is MV. She's 63 years old. She's a retired nurse, believe it or not. She does have uh, breast, no breast cancer. She's had a mastectomy. She's now receiving chemotherapy radiation. She does have a significant other. She actually uh, was married, her husband had died, and now she has another significant other with three of her own biological children and four grandchildren that are not around the area at all. So she had been very active in church with her grandkids at school activities, but things have changed significantly. Next slide, please. She's had much more, she's got lymphedema in her right arm, and this has caused you know, more pain. Um, we've got just some basic medications for that. She's getting more nausea, retching, and sometimes vomiting, not only with chemotherapy, but in between doses as well. So she's feeling much more tired, weak. She's not eating much. Even the bite sips, like you talked about, stall frequent, just not really sustaining her. And she's not, her quality of life is really impaired right now. She's had a little bit of dyspnea periodically, but not enough that we even introduce like oxygen or anything of that nature. And we know that, you know, oxygen actually treats more of the hypoxia and hypoxemia than it does for the, you know, that dyspnea side of it. And then for sure, she's been developing even more constipation because she's not eating as well. Um, so we, we've had issues with that as, um, as well for her. Next slide, please. So current medications right now, she's been on oxycodone, she's been on the 10 milligrams, every four hours is needed, kind of was holding her for a while. She's been on Senna one tablet twice a day. She has still, is still receiving chemo, and so she's actively um, seeking treatment at this time. And then it was reported by the family about marijuana, which we haven't talked much about. And we hear that, you know, kind of on the, you know, versus medical marijuana and, you know, all those type of things. So I'm just throwing that into the whole <laughs> kind of where do we go with this? And so that's the last slide. Now, now it's kind of for, up for discussion. Dr. Laura, do you want to talk a little bit? Well, let's see. I think... Um, we'll go back one slide that shows her symptoms on that. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, 
this sounds like someone who's got pretty high functional status and good, you know, still out and active. So I would wonder if she's, has she done any physical therapy for the lymphedema? Does she have lymphedema sleeve and all of those to try to reverse it rather than just medicating? Correct. Yep. And we did. We okay. did it with PT. Awesome. Okay. Um, I think she would be a good ca a good candidate for something like olanzapine. She's got the chemotherapy induced nausea, um, the decreased appetite. Um, might be something the just having to dose it once at night might be a little easier than having to have her take something periodically throughout the day. Um, I'd start if she's pretty tiny and frail. I'd probably start at two and a half milligrams. And she is. She's, um, I, I forgot to say she, yeah. her calitus is quite small. How did you figure that one out? <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, uh, most of them are <laughs> but um and it depends on how sensitive to meds and all that kind of stuff but especially if she's already having some trouble with fatigue i would worry about you know making her too somnolent with with the olanzapine so i'd start really low um let's see and then yeah like i said that might hopefully help with the um with the appetite a little bit for the dyspnea i don't i would probably it sounds like that's less intrusive in her life so I might not throw anything at that pharmacologically yet maybe just like some education some deep breathing some relaxation techniques um, something to kind of just help her stay in the moment and kind of breathe through it and stuff um, with the constipation uh, I don't know my first question is always what's she been on oh yeah she's been on the Senna um, it's a pretty low dose if the Senna's not causing her any side effects I'd probably go up to I'd probably go at least two tablets once a day maybe even two tablets twice a day um just to get her get her kind of cleaned out and get her moving a little bit better um and then um with if she's doing the oxycodone every four hours um find out if she'd be a good candidate for a long acting um so look at what her total 24-hour usage is and then possibly um, oxycodone or um, maybe a fentanyl patch depending on how much she's using um, she, what am I have, we, we didn't think about the fentanyl patch because of how thin she was, thin skinned and yep. uh, okay. such, so we're a little concerned yep. about that. So. Well, and I, I hate to say it, I just, I don't like fentanyl patches. It's everybody's knee jerk reaction is just slap some fentanyl on it. And I just feel like it's so slow and it's so hard to titrate. And again, you've got the absorption issues. If she spikes a fever, she's going to get delirious with it. So yeah, I definitely prefer the oral if we can. Sounds good. Um, and can you address a little bit about marijuana? Uh, well, I work for CHI and we don't use medical marijuana. <laughs> but I mean, like if it's reported to you, what do you do with that? Are we supposed to cover our ears, you know, uh, the fact that it's you not know, under the medical use or what, what is, what's your take on any of that? Like, in, in I don't the, think we have to be. It, yeah, it, I don't think we have to be ignorant of it. I don't think, um, you know, we've told our nurses if if the patients are reporting that they're using it, document it. I mean, because it does make a difference to me in terms of what else I'm giving them. You know, if I know they're on medical marijuana, I'm going to be a little more cautious with any other sedating med, um, you know, and so it's, it's something that we need to know about. Um, and just the knowledge of it, if you work for an institution like ours where they've kind of said, you know, we're not willing to participate in all of that, just noting that they're using it is not condoning it or endorsing it. Um, when when I've run into those situations, I will kind of present, okay, here's here's the facts about medical marijuana. In your case, it might be a reasonable option. I just can't go any further than that is kind of how we've done it. But with patients that are actively using, um, if they're palliative and they're not near end of life, it gets a little tougher because depending on your institution, if you're in a place where they're requiring drug screens, it can be very problematic. Um, for us in, in palliative for our palliative clinic patients, um, unless we have suspicion that there's some type of, of um, abuse go of medications going on, we are not required to drug test because of the protocols that we've set up for our palliative patients. For our non-palliative patients, it's a deal breaker. So again, it kind of depends on the, the what your institution has set up for it. Um, yeah, I kind of got off track there. <laughs> no, no problem. That was, that was fine. We just wanted to kind of throw that out there because we're seeing a little bit more of it, you know, and, yep. you know, it's, it's good for us to have kind of an open discussion as professionals on, on how to, to deal with these uh, versus, you know, are we able to, 
to include that. And like you said, education is the biggest thing that we can do when it's become, you know, that we're aware of it. And then how it may affect the other things that we're implementing. Just like if they're bringing in supplements and herbals and other things as well, too. With, um, right. Um, I had a question about and the other the piece. Oh. Go ahead, Lord. Oh, I was just going to say the other piece would be the safety in the home, just like with any of our opiates. Um, I would want to know if a patient is using medical marijuana so I can help them make sure that they're being accountable with it, that they're keeping it out of, you know, especially with the, some of the edibles that are out there, keep it out of the risk, reach of kids, keep it locked just the same as you do your pain meds. So in that case, I think we need to know so that we can be, we can be assisting with safety. Sounds good. Um, I wanted to go back to the Senna. Do you recommend uh, just plain Senna or Senna S or you have any feeling either way on that under those circumstances okay how do you yeah. make a judgment between uh, the two what was that how do you make a judgment to use it alone or with the combination Kind of depends on response. If if I can, I like I like the the Senna S. I like adding adding the stool softener along with the the laxative. Um, but if they've already got a full bottle of Senna at home, I'm not going to tell them to go out and buy something different. So a lot of it kind of depends on accessibility and you know what's on hand. And then if you would go back to the symptoms one more time. What we ended up doing with her, her dyspnea is we used a handheld fan. It seemed to be the best thing that worked for her. It was very inexpensive, um, and we, we just followed it was the air movement. Uh, I had just, recent, I had just re read an article recently that they were thinking that it has something to do with the trigeminal nerve on the side of their face. Have you heard or seen anything regarding that? No, I've, I haven't. I, I know I have some patients who wear the little fans around their neck and, and it, it does work. I just assumed it's because the air, air is moving more. Yeah. This, uh, again, it was just a speculation one. It isn't evidence-based yet, which is very interesting to see that. But that's what worked for her. We did not have to, like I said, we did not have to bring in anything more and, and change her medications at all. We did do a lot of crystal breathing and helped her with some of those, you know, feedback kind of things and some of the non-pharmacological. So, okay. So, um, can you go back to the meds one more time then? So what would you be adding to her meds then at this time? What would you do, what you're seeing here? Kind of, can you recap kind of what you were thinking? Um, well, we said the olanzapine, um, 2.5. Um, the Senna, if, if it's available and not a huge cost burden to go out and buy another bottle, switching to the Senna S would be great. Um, I'd start two tabs BID. I'd probably go ahead and quadruple it. And knowing that we're probably going to induce some diarrhea, but, you know, let's get things cleaned out. We're going to have to kind of <clears throat> be a little bit more proactive and then draw back if we need to. Um, for pain, again, I, it depends on, I, I couldn't tell you what I would do unless I knew, you know, how much opiate she's using. Um, do we need anything for neuropathic pain with the uh, lymphedema or? You know, and that was kind of something we had talked about as well, too. If for neuropathic, then what's your go-to would you like to use? Um, I know there's kind of been a push towards more gabapentin, but the number needed to treat is actually better for um, tricyclic antidepressants than it is for the gabapentin. Um, I, the, my Favorite is either the nortriptamine or actually disipramine. Those are the least anticholinergic. Um, and disipramine actually can, in some patients, it's not sedating. It's actually a little bit more activating. Um, but that's, that's anecdata depending on your, your patient. Um, with the nortriptyline, I usually start 10 milligrams at bedtime and then titrate by 10 milligrams every three days until either you have side effects or it starts working. Okay. And then the last, if you go back one more time to the symptoms, the only other one too is her appetite. Do you do anything in, a, in conjunction with that? Um, well, that was why I picked the olanzapine. Okay. Do you want to use anything else beyond that at this time? Not, not initially, because I don't. Uh, again, with polypharmacy, I could think of, you know, five different meds that we could start her on, but I, I prefer to kind of let's pick one or two of our most distressing symptoms and hit those hard. And with appetite, we know it's so multifactorial that if we get her sleeping better at night, feeling more awake during the day, we treat the pain a little bit better, that in itself may improve the appetite. So I use, I, I might pick some of my other meds with an idea of, of trying to stimulate the appetite, but I wouldn't directly approach appetite until we had some of the other easier to control symptoms under control better. 
And how much time makes any sense? How much time would you give for this? Would you give days, a week, a month? Uh, how long before you would want to see improvements? I think Depends on the setting. If this was an inpatient palliative patient, I'd be reassessing. The next day, I'd be stopping in to see how, how she felt in the morning with that olanzapine. Is she having any excessive sedation or, or hangover effects? Um, if she is, is it mild enough that we can push through for a few more days? If she slept just as crappy, feels no different in the morning, um, you know, didn't help at all with the nausea, then I'd probably do a more rapid titration. So I could be adjusting, you know, and with the bowel regimen, I, ideally, if, if these are inpatients, that's the best time to really get aggressive with symptom management because you can be adjusting on a day-to-day -day basis, um, especially when it comes to vomiting and constipation, um, anxiety. A lot of those are going to respond pretty quickly to the med management. If it was an outpatient um, on hospice, I'd probably, I'd make the med change and then I'd say, you know, let's maybe follow up, have a nurse visit in maybe three days or so um, in a palliative clinic. I'd make the changes and then uh, anywhere from, you know, maybe a nurse call in a couple of days to see how they're tolerating and then titrate based on, on um, what they report back to the nurse. And then again, it depends on severity of disease and how burdensome it is for them to come in and see me. Um, I, I wouldn't... You can be titrating a lot of these things by phone based on effect. I probably wouldn't necessarily bring her back real quick, but in between visits, we'd be tweaking and kind of kind of titrating as best we could. Thank you. That was very, very helpful. So we're going to open it up for some questions now. Um, again, feel free to do it either via chat or if you want to just go to the meet screen. Thank you. Um, you know, directly, just come on. We, we appreciate the dialogue. Feel free to use your cameras if you have your cameras so that we can see your video and um, we're called in, and then to, um, you can use chat as well. So we have a little bit of time left. Let's see where we are with this. Throw out there, I'm going to throw out, does anybody have any good anecdotal things that you have seen that has worked um, on any kind of symptoms that we've talked about today? That's a good place to start because everybody has, oh, we try this or this. So the, fro the frozen Vaseline balls are amazing, you know, even though people think it's a little gross, but it, it does. It, it does. It's one of those things that works and it's very cost effective. I'm very frugal, so I'm always looking for cost effective things. Quiet group today. Must be the weather, right? <laughs> Getting back <laughs> in the cold. Dr. Laura, I'm going to turn it back to you. Anything else you want to share right now that you're thinking about? Uh, I don't think so. I think we kind of did a pretty broad survey today. Yeah, you covered a lot. It's a lot to absorb, and we really, really appreciate your time doing this.